Well, good day to you all. And as always, I'm so thankful and grateful, very excited that we are back for another edition of our weekly Bible study. It's called TNT or Truth and Transformation right here at the New Sunlight Baptist Church here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Of course, I'm grateful for all of our New Sunlight uh, church family and friends. And then, of course, for all of you who are extended uh, family and friends who join us uh, virtually each and every week. Uh, we thank God for your presence and your participation. And so we encourage you not simply to watch, but to worship with us on Sundays at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time and to join us uh, each and every Wednesday evening, 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can find us at newsunlightbcla.org. Again, newsunlightbcla.org. That's our website. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, there's ways to give uh, online. And so please see us, uh, search us, uh, find us, and we'll be so grateful that we could connect with you. And preferably, our ministries uh, will be a blessing uh, to your life. And so we're going to get right into our journey in through Jeremiah as we continue. Uh, in this study of the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament uh, prophet's record uh, is found uh, in a book uh, named uh, after him. And so the prophet Jeremiah, uh, we're looking and concluding our survey and study of Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13. And so on tonight, I want to uh, get right into this. Uh, and I encourage you to turn with me to Jeremiah at this time, uh, Jeremiah 12 and 13. We, we said uh, the last couple of weeks, we talked both about uh, the idea of Israel's people, uh, God's people, Israel, excuse me, and how they had a covenant that God had established, a relationship, an agreement uh, that God extended himself in power and grace and in mercy and in love, and that what he demanded and expected in return was Israel's extension in gratitude and faith and obedience back to him. And there was a compromise. There was disobedience. There was disloyalty. There was a willingness to trust in other sources of power, so-called sources of power. And so Israel is dealing with the consequences and the contradictions that arise that, that came up uh, in their very situation. Because on the one hand, they have a God who's all powerful, who's kind, who's loving, and who has promised them that he would prosper them. And on the other hand, their situation, their circumstance did not match the God that they knew and the calling that he had on their lives. And so we talked about coping with contradictions, how things don't always line up in our lives. And now tonight, we want to finally get to uh, f uh, finishing up the themes in chapter 12 and in chapter 13. And so tonight I want to talk about what it means when we are uh, forfeiting our favor. So tonight is about forfeited favor. We want to study just briefly uh, in a devotional, but hopefully in a very thorough, uh, succinct uh, sense that Israel in many ways had forfeited the very favor that God wanted to lavish upon them as his special treasure and as his chosen people. And so what I want you to understand is this in very succinctly that God's people were comforted by a false sense of security, a false sense of security, which was encouraged by false prophets who preached messages that promised peace and prosperity without demanding responsibility and repentance. I'm going to do that one more time. There's a lot in there, but I want you to hopefully, prayerfully take this away tonight. If nothing else, God's people were comforted, unfortunately, by a false sense of security, which was given and encouraged by <clears throat> false prophets, those who were not conveying the accurate and authentic message of God. And they preached messages which promised peace and prosperity, but did not demand responsibility or repentance. And isn't it amazing that you can, on the one hand, preach peace and prosperity and comfort and deliverance and, and celebration, and God is worthy of celebration, and he can do all those things. He can give us peace. He can give us prosperity. He can give us comfort and kindness. Yet, if you do not uh, align yourself and adhere to the fact that he also demands responsibility and hearts that are repentant, then you and I forfeit the very favor that God is willing to lavish upon us. And so tonight, I want to look at 
uh, the latter part of chapter 12 and then in 13. And there are six different thrusts, six different principles, six different takeaways, things that Israel forfeited. Israel forfeited these six things, and Scripture tells us what they are. Number one, I want you to see that Israel, because of their disobedience and their distance from God, Israel forfeited, number one, her protection. Because in chapter 12, verses 7 through 17, you see this passage, and I'll read just a couple of verses. It says that I will forsake my house, abandon my inheritance. I will give the one I love into the hands of her enemies. My inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She roars at me, therefore I hate her. That's harsh language, and yet that's the language and message Jeremiah had to proclaim on behalf of God, who said to his own people, you have roared in, in rebellion and rejection of me, and now I must, because of my character, my righteousness, my holiness, I can't dwell in the presence of your sin, your disobedience, your disgrace, and therefore you now forfeit my protection, my covering. I'm going to allow you to be vulnerable now in the presence and in proximity to your enemies because your unwillingness to remain obedient and loyal to me. And I don't know about you, friends, but I never want to get to a place where I feel as though I'm forfeiting the very privilege of God's protection and covering over my life. But yet that's where Israel was because of her sin, her disobedience. She was now forfeiting her protection. But secondly, in chapter 13, verses one through 11, Israel also was forfeiting her usefulness. Israel, again, number two, was forfeiting her usefulness because in verses one through 11, we see this illustration of a linen belt of a, of a, of a waistband. And so uh, this is what the Lord said to me, Jeremiah says, go and buy a linen belt, put it around your waist, but do not let it touch the water. So as Jeremiah was obedient, he bought the belt, put it around his waist. But then the text says the Lord, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. And he was instructed, take the same belt that you're wearing. Now go hide it in a crevice in the rocks. So he went and hid it at Parath, as the Lord told him. Many days later, the Lord told him, go back, get the belt that you hid. And he went, he dug up the belt, took it from the place where it was hidden. But now, guess what? It was ruined and useless. That's what verse 7 says. And what Jeremiah then had to convey to the people is what, say, what is uh, stated in verse 9. This is what the Lord says. In the same way, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. These wicked people who refuse to listen to my words and follow, uh, the, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them will be like this belt, completely, verse 10 says, useless. And so Israel was forfeiting her usefulness, that God had designed her, chosen her, placed her in the midst of other peoples and nations so that he could utilize her, use her as a witness to reveal his glory, his grace, his power to the world, and yet they were rendering themselves useless. Do you not know that you render yourself useless when you are disobedient to God? That God cannot use you the way that he wants to and the way that he could if you do not surrender yourself and are not willing to be used by him. God will never force you to be used the way that he chooses to use you. He's still sovereign, but he wants to know that you're willing to adhere to his instruction. And so Israel forfeited protection. They forfeited usefulness. But if you keep going, verses 12 through 14, verses 12 through 14, number three, Israel forfeited her stability. Look at verse 12. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, every wine skin should be filled with wine. And if they say to you, don't, uh, don't we know that every wine skin should be filled with wine? Then tell them, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to fill with drunkenness all who live in this land, including kings who sit on David's throne, priests, prophets, and all those who are living in Jerusalem. I will smash them one against the other, parents and children alike, declares the Lord. I will allow no pity or mercy or compassion 
to keep me from destroying them. Now that's, that's tough. That's a tough text to hear that God had reached a point where he was no longer going to allow his own people to enjoy their stability. He said, I will fill with drunkenness all who live in this land. That there's going to be instability. That, that the very thing that, that was at the foundation of them being able to keep uh, their, their steadiness and their equilibrium, their balance, their ability to manage their circumstances. God says, I'm going to remove that sense of stability, that, that, that move that sense of presence because of your unwillingness to find your refuge in me. But I want you to look at verses 17 through 20, because number four, not only do we have protection and usefulness and stability that has been forfeited, but number four, Israel was about to forfeit her freedom. She was going to forfeit her freedom because verses 17 through 20, there's the threat of captivity. There's this threat of captivity. Actually, all the way up to verse 15 and 16, you also find that there's this threat of captivity because <clears throat> he says here and pay attention. Don't be arrogant. God is speaking. Give glory to him before he brings darkness. And watch this before your feet stumble. Verse 16 says on the darkening hills before you stumble, give God glory. But then go down to 17. If you would not, <clears throat> if you do not listen, I'll weep in secret because of your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly. Uh, overflowing with tears because the Lord's flock will be taken captive. So again, their freedom, their liberty, their ability to move freely in the favor of God and how God was positioning them and prospering them. They're about to forfeit all of that. And they're going to end up in exile under the rule of the Babylonian king because of their disobedience. That's what Israel is forfeiting. So they forfeited. Protection, we see the text saying they're going to forfeit their usefulness. They're going to forfeit their stability. They're going to forfeit their freedom. Do you not know that you can also lose your sense of protection, your sense of usefulness, your sense of stability, and your sense of freedom? But fifth, Israel was forfeiting her tranquility, her peace, her, her, her sense of comfort, her sense of rest. Verse 21, one verse, verse 21 Chapter 13, here's what it says. What will you say when the Lord sets over you those who those you cultivated as your special allies? Will not pain grip you like that of a woman in labor? In other words, God's saying those that you've designated as allies, though God has not said that you can look to other peoples and nations and communities for a sense of value, for a sense of allegiance or assistance, this is what I call the hazard of helping God, that we, you and I are not qualified to help God. God doesn't need our assistance. We are simply to be faithful and obedient. We participate in the agenda that God has set, but God does not need us to go find allies. God will position us and put allies in our path. But the text says Israel decided she would cultivate her own. She would go out and therefore, because of that, would endure suffering and pain, be gripped like that of a woman in labor. And that's one of the most excruciating uh, pains that any human being can feel is a woman going through labor. The excruciating pain of labor. That's the, the descriptive language that is used to describe the fact that Israel was now forfeiting her peace, her tranquility, her, her ability to be at ease and rest and relax in the presence and refuge of God. But finally, protection, usefulness, stability and freedom, tranquility. But finally, number six, Israel was forfeiting her dignity. I want you to hear this and we're done. Israel was forfeiting her dignity. Verses 22 and 23. If you ask yourself, why has this happened? It is because of your many sins your many sins, Israel, that your skirts have been torn off and your body has been mistreated. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. 
That's, that's a tough, tough text. Again, that language is striking, but it says, just as a wild cat can't change his spots, just as an Ethiopian, uh, someone uh, who uh, is from the upper Nile region, a Kushite from that part of Africa, just, just as their distinct uh, pigmentation can't be changed by them because they, they are, they are the, we are the, the creatures, not the creator. And just as a, a vulnerable woman whose skirt has been torn and who's been mistreated, you have now been robbed of your very dignity. You've been robbed of dignity and honor and value all because of disobedience, Israel. Go down to verse 26 and verse 27 and we conclude with this. I will pull up, I will pull up your skirts over your face that your shame may be seen. Your adulteries and lustful uh, names, your shameless prostitution. I've seen your detestable acts on the hills, in the fields. Woe to you, Jerusalem. How long you will be unclean? How long will you be unclean? So Israel's robbing herself of dignity. The way that a woman, sadly, could be mistreated, robbed of her dignity, robbed of her honor and grace and elegance. That's what God is saying. They are setting themselves up for indignity and dehumanization and inhumanity because they're going to be subjected to the rule of a nation who is pagan that does not care about God. And that's what happens to us when we decide that we're going to be disloyal, disobedient, that we can do it ourselves. What we're really doing, we're forfeiting the favor of God. So I encourage you in conclusion not to forfeit God's favor upon your life. You can be saved. You can be a child of God and still run the risk of forfeiting the very favor of God in your life. It's not that God doesn't love you. It's not that God does not want to be in relationship with you. It's that your fellowship has been fractured, interrupted, stifled. It's that the favor of God's protection and your usefulness in his kingdom, on his behalf, in representation of him, your stability, your peace of mind, your freedom, your dignity, all of that can be enjoyed or it can be forfeited. And you can find yourself looking and searching and yearning and desiring and wishing that you had peace of mind, wishing that you could actually do more than go to bed, but that you could actually get some rest. Because laying down and getting some rest are two different things. Don't spend your nights pacing or turning. Don't spend your days wondering and worrying, but spend your time knowing, having the certainty, having the reassurance that God can and will favor your life. Not exempt you from pain or suffering, not inoculate you from uh, the, the challenges of this world, but he will favor you with his presence, favor you with dignity, favor you with protection. He'll favor you with his power to give you peace in the midst of uncertainty, but you forfeit that when you choose not to be obedient. So I urge you, I charge you, I encourage you, be obedient, be faithful, and if you do that, you can stay away from this reality of forfeited favor. Well, as always, we're going to be back Sunday morning live at 10 a.m. virtual worship experience. And then next week again, we'll also uh, be continuing as we go forward uh, with our Bible study. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again for worship and for TNT. And to all of my new Sun Life friends and family, uh, we're so grateful to each and every one of you, to our extended family. We love you and we thank God for all that you're doing. I need to announce this. We're actually excited because we have Women's Day coming up on Sunday. We're, we're going to have a dynamic worship service. Mrs. Tiffany Washington, our director of children and youth, she's going to give the message on Sunday for Women's Day. We're going to have uh, on Thursday evening, uh, The Struggle is Real, uh, How to Have Peace, and wellness in the midst of chaos. This is our mental health and wellness uh, seminar. We're going to have a virtual uh, discussion about how to keep your mental health and sustain yourself during this, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're in. So whether it's Thursday night at, at, at 6 o'clock or next Sunday at 10 a.m., or we're going to have our first virtual State of the Church address 
on uh, the first Wednesday of August, August the 5th at 6 o'clock. So we have so many things coming up in the life of our church. We encourage you to be a part of that. We look forward to it. And again, finally, I pray that God, as always, would keep you in his care. That's my prayer in the name of Jesus. I love you and I thank you. And we'll see you again next time. Peace.